It's a very, very good question. Why should we believe in the Big Bang, right? The, the Big Bang is a, a nice, concise phrase that when you unpack it is really this massive scientific theory. It's a model. It's a story about our universe based on evidence because that's what science is. But it's a story about our universe from its very earliest moments all the way to the present day. And it makes some amazing statements like, we live in an expanding universe. Like, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Like, we are surrounded from relic radiation from the very early universe. Like, and this is perhaps the most astounding thing of all, that the universe was different in the past, had a completely different character, and it will be different in the future. That, I think, is perhaps one of the most powerful statements of modern cosmology. That, the universe changes, that the universe evolves, that the universe is different in different epochs of time. The universe itself, the cosmos on the very grandest scales, is evolving the same way that we go through a life. So we're born, we live, we have different stages of life, and then we die. Our universe was born. We're not we're a little bit fuzzy on that being born part of that. That's, that's another show, but it certainly had younger epochs, it had more mature epochs and has a long, long, long future ahead of it. And what it will look like in the future is different than what it looks like now. And what the universe looked like in the past is different than what the universe looks like now. And that's a, that's a big thing, right? That's a big, bold, in your face statement. And it's a statement based on evidence because everything we do in science, we don't take lightly, right? We don't, we don't just say like, hey guys, you know what? You know what? I think that the universe used to be smaller in the past. And then all the other scientists just say, you know what? I think you're on some. All right, that's it. That's it. We're done. No, that's not, that's not how it works in science. You don't just make random statements and then everyone believes you. It's all based on evidence. It's taken, we first started to get this picture of how the universe works at the biggest scales about 100 years ago with Hubble's discovery of an expanding universe. There were some signs before that in the late 1800s that uh, the universe might be up to something funny, but it was really the early 1900s where it really took off and cosmology is a field. Cosmology is the study of the whole entire universe as a single physical object. That's when it really started to get going. And this theory, this model, this history of our universe is based on real solid evidence. You can't escape. That's the amazing thing about science is mother nature is telling us stuff. And all we have to do, all we do in science is listen very, very carefully. And we learn. We cannot avoid this conclusion. It's the only conclusion that fits all available pieces of evidence. Evidence number one, actually, let me go back. Evidence number zero is that the night sky is dark. Think about this. Think about this. If our universe were, say, infinite in size, if we lived in an infinitely big universe, and where the universe was also infinite in age, where there is no beginning to the universe. So infinite in age and infinite in size, no matter where you look, there ought to be a star. You could look in any direction and eventually that line of sight would end somewhere at some point at a star. And it has to because there's stars everywhere. We live in an infinite universe and given an infinite amount of time, all that light from all the collective stars. So our night sky should not be dark. It should be blazing. It should look like one continuous like star. We should just be bathed in light. This is called Olber's Paradox. It, of course, was uttered for centuries, uh, but in its modern form, uh, we get it from Olber. And in it's a paradox that points out that if we, if the universe is infinitely large and infinitely old, the night sky ought to be dark. Well, the night sky is dark, so either the universe is not infinite or, and or the universe is not infinitely old. So something's going on. Something's going on in the universe. Evidence number one, no wait, 
let me take a half step back. Evidence number 0 0.5 is the existence of quasars. Quasars, as you know, are these active galaxies. They're incredibly loud in the radio spectrum. And when we look around the nearby universe, you know, galaxies in our little neighborhood, there's, there's, there's not a lot of quasars. It's only when we go way back, we look at distant objects that we start to pick out these quasars. And the quasars surround us, so they're not like clustered over here. They're spread out all over the sky, but they're only very, very far away. They're not close to us. This tells us, again, something funny is going on. Why are there not a lot of quasars nearby, but a lot of quasars further out? If any one patch of the universe ought to be roughly the same as any other patch, why are quasars so far away? One interpretation, and the correct interpretation, is that, oh, light takes time to travel. So nearby galaxies are more recent uh, views of galaxies. And then the further away we look, we're actually looking to perhaps the younger and younger universe. That maybe quasars happened a long time ago. They were more common. Maybe galaxies were more active when they were younger. And now the present day, they've settled down. They've matured. They've quieted down. They bought a house in the suburbs. They have a car. They have a couple kids. They don't go partying so much. So that when we look out, we're also looking back in time because of the travel time of light, the limited limitations of the speed of light. So we're looking back in time and oh, when the universe was younger, quasars were common. Now that the universe is older, they're not so common anymore. That the existence, the raw existence of quasars is a piece of evidence that something funny is going on in the universe. And then, of course, evidence number one is Hubble's expanding universe, the discovery that has been backed up by like a bajillion more observations in the past hundred years. We didn't stop with Hubble, is the discovery that we live in an expanding universe, that galaxies on average are moving away from every other galaxy. Of course, there can be some chance collisions, some gravitational interactions that doesn't spoil the big picture, which is on average, every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. So the night sky is not dark. Quasars were more common in the past. Galaxies used to be closer together in the past. You put this together and you get the beginnings of the Big Bang Theory that at its core is that in the past, the universe used to be smaller and it used to be more dense and it used to be hotter. That is the basic core principle underlying everything else in the Big Bang Theory. From that statement, if you say, okay, the universe used to be smaller in its past, you get everything else. You can start calculating. You can start, you can start uh, predicting. What did the universe look like in the past? It wasn't just like all the galaxies closer together because eventually you get everything so smushed together, it starts to change state. Everything you go back in time, maybe the universe was, I don't know, like a million times smaller than it is now. Everything is so smushed together. The temperatures are high. The pressures are high where all the gas, there are no stars. There are no distinct galaxies. Everything's squished together in one big hot ball of gas. That's a plasma. And then you run the clock forwards a little bit and this plasma expands and cools off and then cools off enough that it changes phase from being a plasma to being neutral hydrogen gas. And that allows it to be transparent to light. Oh, and that light would be really, really hot. It'd be really like literally white hot thousands of, of degrees Celsius. Uh, but that light would still be hanging around. Oh, but the universe is expanding, so that light would get stretched out, so it ought to be cooler now. It ought to be uh, just mm, a few degrees above absolute zero, just a few Kelvin, and which would put that light in the microwave. And that light ought to be behind every star, every galaxy that we see. It's this leftover relic fossil radiation from the earliest moments of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. Boom. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background in the 50s was like the major linchpin for our modern Big Bang picture. You cannot, and people have tried, you cannot put together a picture of cosmology, a picture of the history of the universe, 
that is consistent with all the other things that we test and we know about science like special relativity, like electromagnetism and gravity, and try to explain away the cosmic microwave background. The only conclusion that's left is the universe used to be smaller and hotter in its past. It's changing. But there's more. There's more. Because if you take that exact same picture, oh, like uh, a long time ago when the universe was a million times smaller than it is now, it was a plasma. What if it was so small and so tiny and so intense that instead of just thousands of degrees, it was millions of degrees. And it was like an intense nuclear reactor where even protons and neutrons themselves hadn't yet formed. We'd broken them apart into their constituent parts, the quarks and the gluons. And then as the universe cooled, the, the protons and the neutrons, they congealed out of that soup. And they formed the first atoms. They formed hydrogen and helium, maybe a little bit of lithium, maybe a couple other things. And you could run the numbers because we know nuclear physics. We have things like nuclear bombs and nuclear power plants. So we kind of understand nuclear physics. You say, oh, you can run the numbers. And if there's this much radiation and, 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 you, and you start plugging in the numbers and you come to a prediction, you come to a prediction for the relative amount of hydrogen and helium and lithium and a few other elements in our universe, the primordial elements in our universe, the elements that were formed in the first few minutes of the history of the universe, the first few minutes of the Big Bang. You make a prediction. You can say, you can calculate, you say, you know what, if the Big Bang story is right, then when we look out at all the stuff in the universe, it ought to be around three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium, and then a few percent other stuff. And then that's the challenge to the observers. Here you go. Here is a bona fide prediction of the Big Bang model. You go out to the observation, say, now astronomers go find that. They go out, do their astronomy thing and they come back and say hey we report a universe that has about three quarters hydrogen one quarter helium and a few percent other stuff i would drop this microphone but it's kind of expensive like you can't you can't get around it that is a solid prediction of the big Bang theory and there's been more there's been more but i would say those are the key pieces of evidence for the big bang theory that the night sky is dark that quasars are a thing, that we live in an expanding universe, that the cosmic microwave background exists, and the this process that we call Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the formation of the lightest elements in the universe, matches observations. That's it. You can't escape the conclusion of the Big Bang Theory as hard as you've tried. And we've tried. Real scientists with real math and real axes to grind and real desires for Nobel Prizes have been trying for decades and they can't get around it. And so we, we live in an expanding universe. We live in a Big Bang universe. And the fundamental, one of the most fun statements to make is that 13.8 billion years ago, our universe, every star, every galaxy, everything we know and love was crammed into a ball the size of a peach that had a temperature of over a trillion degrees. That's a wonderful statement to make. And it's so exciting to be able to make statements like that, thanks to all the hard work of all the observations and all the theories that have come in the past century. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please hit like and subscribe. Uh, go to patreon.com slash to help me help support me uh, make more of these because they're kind of fun to make. Thanks.